If y'all would turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, we'll be starting in verse 15. If you found that, please bow your head and your hearts, and Lord God, we just thank you uh, for all that you're done, all that you're doing. Thank you for the ladies' ministry and, uh, and that uh, you have seen to it that uh, Jane is, is kind of moved out of that. You, you, you've brought us someone else, Lord, and we know we won't miss a step. Uh, at any rate, we praise you for that. And Lord, we just ask you to open our hearts and our minds and let us hear not only about prophecy and timelines and the things that we can kind of get distracted with sometimes, but Lord, I ask that you would, we would hear your faithfulness uh, through the message too. And we just ask you to put that in our hearts and, and in, as it comes to our ears, Father, and, and bless us in this, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, y'all had a great deal to take in last week. And uh, as by the questions and the, the getting, I won't stand in a corner anymore, I know that. I got cornered, uh, but uh, I know some of you felt like you were probably drinking out of a fire hose, and that's fine. Don't worry. Uh, you know, it takes time to process this sort of thing, and you might well feel the same today after we're done, but uh, because we're going to be referencing more Old Testament scriptures in an attempt to remain consistent with our, our interpretation as we go through this, and we'll have a few more Greek definitions also, at least we'll touch on them, but... That's what must be done if we, if we want to glean all we can from the passage, if we want to, to, be, to be able to uh, rightly divide the word of truth. Last night in the, the worship meeting dinner, Jacob t- uh, touched on some, did word, some word study, brought up some stuff about some of the different words. And, uh, and when you do that, it just really, it's like, you know, you can have a, a hamburger it's just a meat patty and a, and a bun, and then you can have ketchup on it, and mustard, and mayonnaise, and onions, and pickles, and you can go on from there. And when you, when you get into the original languages, and I'm not trying to make this overly technical, you, all you need is a concordance for, for the basics of it, but it really it's like pouring the ketchup and the mustard and everything on just what can be a dry burger. And it's the color commentary. You know, if you're watching the ball game, you have one guy saying that he's carrying the ball down the, the field and he's knocked down at the 35-yard line. And then you've got this other guy that, that elaborates on that. All right? That's the color commentary. And so that's one of the things we need to do, and it needs to be done in the right way. But, but it's, it's so important that we use all the tools in our toolbox and not just read over our Bibles or just this is the way it's always been taught or whatever, and go on with things because we just really miss so much. Now, last week we ended by looking at several phrases that are commonly misunderstood, and I think they're oftentimes placed in an end-time scenario when they don't, don't have to be. Uh, we looked at a phrase such as, all the world, and to the American mind, that's the whole globe. But uh, we saw how Consistently, throughout its biblical usage, that phrase basically refers to the Roman Empire, the Near Middle East, the Mediterranean Basin, the Adriatic Sea. That was the world in which they swam, and look at the definition and the usage. Um, We looked at the word nations, which uh, which in the typical Old Testament usage refers to Gentiles, those outside of Israel. We looked at the phrase, the end which automatically we want to attach to the end of the world. But there's two different Greek words here with two different definitions. And if you don't differentiate between those, you wind up funneling everything into a last days scenario. Um, In the context of the passage of the destruction of the temple, that word in telos means the the destruction of a, a near age. It's the end of the Jewish age. All right, the old system's going out. The new system's coming in. Uh, Jesus has come, as we've read throughout the, the Gospel of Matthew. Um, he's been talking about the kingdom. He's, come, he's actually initiated the kingdom. That we, as he's come into Jerusalem dealing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he's told them over and over again, as well as the people, anyone that will listen, that essentially these guys are being rendered obsolete. There's no more need for that. He's talked about it. Jesus said, you know, you worship in the temple. I'm going to tell you the temple now is, is here, all right? And it's no longer just a national identity. It's, it's an international identity. 
whosoever will may come. It's not just a Jewish or an Israeli thing anymore, Israelite thing anymore. It is whosoever will may come. And you've got to take that into the picture as you come into Matthew 24. So now we're reading about, uh, with the, this, this old guard going out, we're now reading about the window of time between J Jesus' resurrection and the destruction of the temple, which is in 70 A.D., which is roughly 40 years. It doesn't have to be exactly 40 years, but that is generally what you most scholars now call a generation. So in essence, we're looking at Jesus' predictions of a 40-year window, which ends with the cataclysmic event of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. That's what we're dealing with in the first section of Matthew 24, because they asked two questions. We're not arbitrarily moving around. Oh, he, now he's talking about this question, now he's talking about that question, with no rules to govern the conversation. They asked him two questions. He's answering the first one in the first 35 verses. Now, thus far, Jesus has told the disciples not to despair about war, pestilence, famine, rumors of war, and all those things. Those things are often taken and trying to be placed, trying to have them placed in an end time scenario. But Jesus is actually saying the opposite, okay? He's not saying, this is going to happen, so freak out and put it no. He's saying, they've always happened. They're always going to happen. Take heart, but the end is not near. Get that? But if you come into it with a presupposition that we're, all we're talking about is you know, the great tribulation and all that sort of thing, then you're going to miss it. Look at what he's saying. You see, then he tells them, you know, they've got to hold the line because you're going to face martyrdom, some of you. And you're going to face betrayal. And they're going to talk bad about you. They're going to put bad Facebook posts about you. They're going to not like stuff. You know, it just goes on and on. But now we get to verse 15. That's what he talked about in the first... 14 verses, but now we get to, to, to verse 15, and Jesus' chronology really amps up right here uh, from the things that, that will occur at the time he's speaking in the next 30, 35 years to those things that will happen right at the end, the telos of that Jewish age, and that is the destruction of Jerusalem. So look at Matthew 24, beginning at verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as it has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's, the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Now automatically, people are telling, that's got to be talking about the last days. Hold up. I'm going to show you that it's not. It's a Judean context, it's an Israelite context, it's a Jerusalem-centric context. All right, we'll talk about that. But he says here, coming as we roll into verse 15, Therefore, when you've seen all these things, you shouldn't be surprised. All these things, those shouldn't surprise you. This has been dragged out. All those four, first 14 verses, these things have been dragged out for 30, 35 years. All right, just slowly coming along, sometimes in waves. But all of a sudden, there's going to be something, boom, that hits. And then you're going to know. Now, all right, you don't get lulled to sleep. Now something's going to happen. Don't be surprised, but the end of the temple age, that's what telos means, is not yet. But the abomination of desolation that he speaks about here is a clear cue to get out of Jerusalem, okay? Now Luke's parallel account in Luke 21, 20 says this, and he makes it very clear about what's talking about. If there's any ambiguity, Luke takes it out. He says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. That's the cue. Now, we've been for years, we've dealt with famine and pestilence and all these sorts of things and false messiahs, and all of a sudden, they wake up one morning and, I mean, they had a clue it was coming because all the war, you had almost four years of war before Jerusalem is destroyed. But they get out and look out, and there you go. There's Titus, Vespasian's son. Out there with his armies, they've laid siege to the city. You know, you've got to work hard to get out. Nobody's coming in. Now you know, that's what Luke says. When you see Jerusalem surrounded, know that its desolation is near. So Luke links the abomination 
with the siege of Jerusalem. Now, that's clear. That's right there in the text. Now, you have to do some gymnastics to try to, to pull that out and stick it 2,000 years into the, into the future. But when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, and he says, now, he who reads, or she who reads, let them understand. And now Jesus takes them back to an Old Testament passage in order to give them a more complete picture of what's going to happen. And we are doing this every time we hit that, and he, it's not always mentioned in your Bible. It's not always a little cross-reference. But the phrasing, the phraseology, the language, the, the thought in the Hebrew mind is there. So Jesus takes them back, and that's what we're consistently trying to do. So let's look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Now, historically speaking, most scholars believe that this refers to the time, which was still yet future in Daniel's day, but in the past, when Jesus was here, when Antiochus Epiphanes conquered Jerusalem. You've heard of Alexander the Great. You, know, you had the Babylonian kingdom conquered Israel. You had the Medo-Persian kingdom. They, were, they conquered the Babylonians. Alexander the Great, the Grecian Empire, conquered uh, the Medo-Persian Empire, and then Rome conquered um, the, the, uh, the Grecian Empire. Alexander the Great died in Babylon. His empire, he didn't leave a successor, so he went to the strong. You know, whoever's bad enough to take it, let them have it. Well, it was divided up into four different groups, into four generals. And one of those generals was Antiochus Epiphanes. That was the Seleucid kingdom. They were in what is now modern-day Syria and Turkey and, and northern Iraq and all that. Well, it, it, I think it's yeah, 167 AD, uh, excuse me, 167 BC. He comes in, takes Israel, you know, trashes everything, comes into the temple, uh, you know, starts killing priests, all this kind of stuff, and then brings pigs in, takes down the, the ark, I mean, excuse me, the, the altar in there, sets up a pagan altar and starts slaying pigs and sacrificing them there in the temple in Jerusalem, which a pig is unclean. And he's a Gentile, therefore he's unclean. So that is the abomination that Jesus is referring to right here. Now, uh, historically speaking, but he likens that. He says, when you see this, something like that, then no. All right, it's come here. So then we've got to figure out, well, what is he talking about here? The abomination Jesus is speaking of has to follow what is written. And that doesn't mean he, that whatever he's speaking of has to follow exactly what Antiochus did. All right? You don't have to have another guy come in, knock everything down, and start killing pigs. It's, it just, it's something that's an abomination akin to that. So the abomination of Matthew 24 should closely resemble bringing an end to the sacrifices, uh, making desolate things until the, until the consummation is poured out on the desolate. We don't necessarily have to have another pig slaughtered or a pagan altar set up in the temple. We only have to have an end to the sacrifices and the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and something the Jews... And, 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 or something the Jews would consider to be an abomination. And that's what we had in 70 AD. Now, I'm not saying that there's not necessarily something like that to happen yet in the future. All right, before everybody gets their knickers in a twist, know that. All right, I'm not even going there. We're dealing with this right now. All right. So, Jesus says, look, when you see something like that, you know. And Luke says, when you see the army surrounding Jerusalem, know. So what happens? Historically speaking, in 66 AD, according to Josephus, I'm now reading this, it says, the violence which began at Caesarea in 66 was provoked by Greeks of a certain merchant house sacrificing birds, probably unclean birds, in front of a local synagogue. In reaction, one of the Jewish temple clerks, Eleazar ben Hananiah, names the guy specifically, ceased prayers and sacrifices for the Roman emperor at the temple. So you already got some issues going on with emperor worship at or around the temple. Protests over taxation, I, I get you on that one. Protests over taxation joined the list of grievances and random attacks on Roman citizens and perceived, and perceived traitors occurred in Jerusalem. The Jewish temple was then breached by Roman troops at the order of the... Pro, now, this is 66, not 70. This is the beginning of the war. 
The Jewish temple was then breached by Roman troops at the order of the procurator Gessius Florus, who had 17 talents removed from the treasure of the temple. That's millions of dollars in our money. Claiming the money was for the emperor. Now, this is what kicks off the war. This is not the end at 70 and 70 AD. This is what kicks off. So even in 66 AD, you've already had an abomination. Gentiles have come in, sacked the temple, and taken what was God's. You've already had it, something akin to the abomination. So if you want to go there, you can say, well, there it was fulfilled. I think that the, the, the truth is, if you read the history, that something like that has happened several times already between uh, Jesus' birth and, and Jesus in, in, in the middle part of the first century, Rome had already attempted to set up Greek statues in the temple, and then they'd get talked out of it because somebody said, look, you're going to start a war, just leave it alone. This sort of thing was fairly commonplace, all right? So, even before the destruction of the temple, this, it's already been ransacked and robbed. That in and of itself was an abomination. And there are actually a few other times between 30 and 70 A.D. that something similar happened. The point is um, that this was not something unknown to the Jews and the events of 70 A.D. were not so isolated as we may think. There are two big gaps when it comes to Christians when it talks to history, that, talking about history, and that is from the time of the Old Testament to the time John the Baptist comes on the scene, the intertestamental period. Most people, it just goes blank. 400 years, nobody says anything. They think nothing's been written about it. There's all kinds of history. All, Jews are fighting wars. I mean, it, it's all sorts of stuff out there. And then we've got this dead spot between Jesus' ascension and now, well, you know, some, yeah, or, or we'll just say 70 A.D. Because most church history doesn't pick up till after that. There's this dead spot where all sorts of things are happening. Okay, so you, you get the idea. So let's continue in Matthew 24. And I want you to see how the language, the language here, I'm going to go back to verse 16. I want you to see how the language refers to life in first century, first century Palestine, that it's Jerusalem-centric, that it's Israelite-centric. Then let those who are in Judea flee to, the, flee to the mountains. Flee. Flee to the mountains. There's a hint. Those in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house because they didn't have central heat and air. They slept in the good weather out on the roof. And he's saying, if this happens, you wake up and there it is. Don't even take the time to pack your bags. Get out of Dodge. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. Get out of Dodge. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Why? Because you're trying to run like this or, or carrying babies and all that stuff. It's, it's just not a good time to flee. And pray that your flight may not be in winter because it's cold and it's harder. Or on the Sabbath because then, as a Jew, your conscience is, can be violated by, you know, you're only supposed to be able to walk no more than a mile on the Sabbath. Anything over that, you've got to tie a string to your home and to your belt, you know, and then you've got to retrace the, traps of the steps of the string. So if you're running from an army, you don't want to be worried about tying your string. And they might could even track you down by that. You know, that's what he's saying. Pray that none of this happens on these. This is a Jewish context. This is a first century context. For then there will be great tribulation. There you go, it's talking about the great tribulation. Nah, not necessarily. Look the word up. It's used all the time. Not in the context of what we call, the way we classify the great tribulation. We'll talk about that in a second. For then there will be great tribulation such as, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. Look at there, it's got to be the end of days. Well, the, the way that the syntax tells you it has to be an historic event and not something in the future, if you're looking at it in the Greek. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So we've seen the, I hope I've shown you, the immediate and local context, Judea, flee to the mountains, around it. Those on the housetop, your flight in winter, the Sabbath, that's all in first century Jewish context. And we get to this, this great tribulation. There's no de definite article there that says the great tribulation. That is a term that in our modern eschatology many people have coined. And so what do we do? Let's think about this. In our 20, 20th and 21st century mind, we do the same thing in a sense that Jesus is talking about. Every time he says a phrase, quotes part of a verse, 
and they hyperlink to the Old Testament. What do we do? We see Great Tribulation, ding, we automatically hyper, uh, hyperlink to the movie or the books we've read and we've seen. That's the wrong answer. You've got to hyperlink to their context and see what it's talking about. Look up the word and all the usages. If I'm not mistaken, there's one Greek word that's used all the time for tribulation. It means oppressing or pressure, all right? Stress. All right? Now, it can be real bad, like the end of the world, or it can be something not like the end of the world, like maybe Jerusalem being under siege. Um, Paul talks about, I'm in tribulation with you. The apostle John in the book of Revelation says, I'm with you in this present tribulation. You take that as however you want. But it's used a lot of different ways. All I'm saying is don't automatically try to lift it out of the context and hyperlink it to, to something that has been taught uh, nowadays. That's just not right. I'm not saying it does. It, I'm, I don't believe it could mean that. But all I'm saying is don't jump to that conclusion. And then we've got this crazy over-the-top language, and we're going to see a lot of it today. It's called hyperbolic. You don't know what the term hyperbole is? Hyperbole? Hyperbole? Hyperbole. It's over the top, man. I mean, it's just, you know, like, you know, I don't know. It might not, it's not proper to say nowadays. When I was young and I'd be in trouble, mama would tell me, I'll beat you within an inch of your life. Oh, my God, this guy will beat you in prison. I got the message. Stop doing whatever you're doing because you're going to be this far. That's hyperbole. My mother would never do that to me. Or you, we used to have a saying, you know, I'll stop. I'll, uh, I'll, how we say it? been a long time. Uh, I'll stomp a mud hole in you and walk the puddle dry. You know, that's hyperbole, okay? And, you know, that sort of thing. And that's what you're going to see here. The problem is we read it and we take the Bible literally. And then we go off on this tangent that they would have never seen in that day. So we come across this language. It says it's something that's never been since the beginning of the world to the end of time. And this is hyperbolic language. I'll give you a couple of references. Daniel 12, 1 and Joel 2, 2. And you'll show, it'll show that this wasn't, it, his, like I said, the very phraseology in Greek shows that it has to be something that's all, in our time has happened, but not something in, in the very future. And I'm trying to give you some technicalities without choking you on it, all right? Then it says that the, this time will be shortened for the, le, the elect's sake. Well, the siege wound up only lasting five months. What most people don't understand is within Jerusalem, you had a civil war going on inside the city between different factions of Jews. They're killing each other before the Romans even get there. The Sadducees and their followers have one part of the temple. The Pharisees have another, and some have this, this neighborhood and that neighborhood. It's like street gangs warring. And so then when the Rome, um, they're, and they're fighting each other, and when Rome lays siege, you know what they do? Because they've got tons of food stored in the city. And they're afraid that a lot of the people aren't going to have the stomach to fight. So they're like, they're going to either retreat or negotiate. So you know what they do? They burn all their food. You've got to fight now because there's nothing left to eat. You want to die, die fighting or you, and hope we get their lunch? Or are you going to die of starvation? And so all of this is going on. This is, I mean, it's just read what Josephus says about it. It's a blow-for-blow blow account. And, and if it hadn't been for that, millions of died. Josephus says almost a million died anyway. Tacitus says it's closer to like half a million. People died between the siege and the warfare and all that's going on. But, there, but I think it's Tacitus or Eusebius. I don't remember one of the historians says, but... The church that was in Jerusalem got out of Dodge when they saw the Romans surround the, surrounding the city, which is what Jesus is saying. Get out of the city when you see this coming, and that's what the church at Jerusalem did. So the siege wound up only lasting five months. If it had not, if it had gone on for longer than that, you would have had a lot more people die. But as far as we know, I don't know if it's everybody in the church. It doesn't mean the only people that were members, you know, members of the church got out, but most of the believers in Christ did because they heeded this warning. And the fact that it only lasted five months brought relief to those that who, who remain in the city. We've even got, I got a picture up here that, there you go, there's, that's on the, 
the, one of the arches there in Rome where it shows the army taking away, there's the menorah and some other things from the temple. One of them was like a gigantic movie camera. Because they were, you know, the war correspondents were there. I don't know what, you know, all that, all that. I just, I can recognize the menorah and, and some trumpets and, and it even looks like the ark. So there you go. Get on that, get on that rabbit trail where the ark is. We're not talking about that right now. But you see, it, it was, it's, some of it's um, captured historically. So we've gotten that far. Look and then look at verse 23. Then if anyone says to you, and Jesus already touched on this earlier, but he's coming back to it. If anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, the anointed, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, don't go out there looking for him. Or look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. So what is he saying here? Because this is what happens, isn't it? I mean, if we were laid siege to today, we're in the last days. Maybe we are, maybe we aren't. The whole point is Jesus has been telling them for, for several verses now that these things, famine and wars and pestilences, these are not good signs to tell when you're near the end. What's the good sign? When Jerusalem is surrounded by its armies. It's the end of this age that he's talking about. And so he says, look, when, what, what's going to happen? It's gonna, we're going to come under all this pressure, this tribulation, and people are going to say, is Jesus here? Because in their minds, all of this is linked into one event. The end of the Jewish age, they're Jews. The end of the Jewish age, and then Jesus comes back, and we go back to the golden age of, of King David. And, and, is, and, and is he here? Is he here? Well, look at all this stuff. He's got to be back. No, he's not. Why not believe it? Well, he has to come now. That's what they're thinking. He has to come now. They're coming, you know, you know why? why then Jesus says, don't believe it. Don't believe I'm here. They're going to say, and you hear this today. The New Age is the Lord Maitreya. He's in Paris or somewhere waiting to be revealed. That's their New Age Messiah. Or Jesus is hiding here. Or he's camped out with Jimmy Hoffa and Elvis in Wisconsin somewhere working at a car wash until the time of his revelation. You hear all this kind of junk. See, Jesus says, don't believe it. Don't believe I'm here. Don't even believe that I'm coming to this thing. The next verses clarify that because it gives us a contrast between the parousia, which is the Greek word that is consistently used for Jesus' second coming, not only in Matthew but by the Apostle Paul, and then the coming of the events in 70 A.D., and if you don't distinguish between those two Greek words, you've got something messed up worse than a football bat because you can't make a distinction. Everybody, And that's what happens. He's the son of man coming. It's got to be the second coming. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Not if you look at the original language. And Jesus draws a distinction in verse 27 saying, I'm going to show you why there's no need to go looking for me when all this comes down. Verse 27 says this, For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the son, coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Second coming will be like this, like lightning. And this, these, this verse right here is, is a parenthesis, if you want to call that. It's actually a dichotomy. It's something totally opposite from what Jesus has been talking about. And he's saying this, There's no need to look for the Messiah in some obscure place because his parousia, his second coming, will be like a lightning flash. Everybody's going to see it. And, and, and he goes on to explain this in verses 36 through 44. We'll talk about it next week. He says, everybody's going to see it's going to be like a lightning flash. It's not going to be some slow wave, ebb and flow of things. It's just going to be boom, and there it is. And there's nothing you can do to predict it. It's just going to be that fast. And so nobody can see if he's, he's over there and he's hiding. No, I'm not. He's up there, and he's not hiding, but he's up there, and then boom, it, there it is. The parousia is like a flash of lightning from the east to the west. So also with the parousia of the coming of the Son of Man be, for where the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. When you see buzzards, you know there's something dead. You see them on the golf course, I say, hey, Baker, they're looking for you. <laughs> and he has something smart to say, which we're not even going to go into that because it doesn't make any sense. But at the parousia, once again, there won't be this prolonged buildup such as a siege. You see the difference in lightning strike in the parousia? 
in 30 years of war and pestilence and famine and then a siege and all that siege warfare entails that's happening for, for five months. In fact, all that Jesus has spoken of thus far has been dragged out of the course of some 40 years. But the parousia, and he's bringing this to, to, to note the difference, the dichotomy, the parousia won't be that way. It's going to be like lightning. It'll be instantaneous without a precursor so that no one knows precisely when it's coming. Does that throw some, some possible questions be asked in eschatology elsewhere? Yeah, it does. We're going to have to deal with it. But I'm just, that, that's what this means. So the mention of the parousia in this context is intended precisely to distinguish it from the events that Jesus was currently considering. Answering the first question is when the temple destruction is. It'll only be after a marked change of subject in verse 36 that the parousia itself will be the focus of the conversation. That's the second part of the question the disciples ask. Then, as we keep rolling in verse 29, then things go back to the events surrounding 70 AD. Why? You can't be arbitrarily changing gears. I'm not, because the phrase, immediately after the tribulation of those days, links back to verse 26, which is something we call the antecedent. Therefore, grammatically, you have to jump back over 27 to go back to what he's been talking about prior to that. Okay? So verse 29 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of man will appear in heaven. Then all the tribes of earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other, and aha, I got you. You've got to be talking about the end times now. No, I don't. And I'm fixing to show you why. Now, wait a minute now. We've got stars falling from heaven. We've got heavens rolling up like a scroll. We've got the earth shaking. Jesus coming on clouds. Very important phrase. And nobody has seen that happen yet. And that didn't happen in 70 AD. It's got to be speaking of the future. It's got to be the end times. No, it doesn't. I'm fixing to show you why. Because don't think like a 21st century American. Let's look at the Old Testament. We got all this hyperbolic, over the top, heavy language. Earth, there's going to be world shaking going on, as they said in Cool Hand Luke. This is some big, heavy stuff. The language, the language, and the language is the cure, is the clue. Because the section is cloaked in Old Testament, hyperbolic, prophetic, what they would call cosmic language. The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, stars fall from heaven, Jesus flying in on clouds and all this. And it doesn't mean he's coming in on a cumulus nimbus. You know, if you know, Joe can define that. He works at the Weather Channel. You know, it doesn't mean he's coming in like that. I'm going to show it to you. Let's look at some stuff. Because all of these phrases have already been used in the Old Testament. So Jesus is quoting Old Testament here. Isaiah 13.1. And the first verse gives you the context. The burden against Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw. Now listen. See if anything perks your ears here. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. I will punish the world for its evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a mortal... Mankind more rare than fine gold. There's hardly anybody walking a planet if you take it quote unquote literally. A man, a man more than the golden wedge of Ophir, still being rare. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth will move out of her place. He's gonna move it out of orbit. That's what it reads like, doesn't it? And the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of His fierce anger. There you go, the day, day of the Lord. There's lots of days of the Lord in the Old Testament. How do I know this isn't talking about the last one? Because it tells me it's about the judgment. Let me go right back up here. The judgment on Babylon. And guess what? That's done happen. It's already happened. We don't have anybody recording astronomical signs, and the Persians certainly did it. It's hyperbolic language. I mean, it's not going to really happen. The event will happen. I'm just telling you that stars, planets aren't going to come raining down and stars and the sun goes dark and the moon goes dark and Jesus flying on a cumulus nimbus 
and all this kind of it's over the top hyperbolic language and he says it's the judgment on Babylon and if you read keep reading that has already happened well it's an isolated event look at Ezekiel 32 verse 1 through 8 look at the context right there in the first verse and it came to pass in the twelfth year in the twelfth month on the first day of the month that the word of the Lord came to me to Ezekiel saying son of man Take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt. All right, so now we're talking about a judgment on Egypt. Say to him, you are like a young lion among the nations, and you are like a monster in the seas, bursting forth in your rivers, troubling the waters with your feet, and fouling their rivers. Thus says the Lord God, I will therefore spread my net over you with a company of many people, and they will draw you up in my net. Then I will leave you on the land. I will cast you out on the open fields and cause you to settle on cause to settle on you all the birds of the heavens. With you I will fill the beasts of the whole earth. I will lay your flesh on the mountains and fill the valleys with your carcass. I will, you know, this is, this is pretty, you know, the Bible tries, it makes it sound nicer than it is. I mean, I'm going to just sling your body out there and the buzzards are going to eat you. I mean, I will also water the land with the flow of your blood. And the Bible's just going to be blood up to a horse's bridle. That's that deep, hyperbolic language. And the river, uh, I will also water the land with the flow of your blood, even to the mountains, and the river beds will be full of you. Where I put out your light, I will cover the heavens and make its stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. All the bright lights of the heavens I will make dark over you and bring darkness upon your land, says the Lord God. And that ring a bell? Judgment on Egypt. Guess what? It's done happened. It's already happened. And historic event, which is the same language was used, in which the same language was used. And I got some more references if you want to check them out, write them out. Joel 2.10 and Joel 2 verses 30 and 31, you'll see similar language. Also Joel 3.15, Amos 8 and 9. The difference here is these judgments on these references I just gave you are not judgments on pagan nations. They refer to the judgment on the northern and the southern kingdoms of Israel respectively after they split. But the key thing is the over-the-top, hyperbolic language used concerning the judgment on Babylon, Edom, and I don't know if I left off, I had one, it was the same thing on the judgment of Edom, I might have skipped it, but get the notes, they're on the, they'll be on the website. Um, and they're, they're, all this language is used about historic events, judgments that have already taken place. Read any Old Testament commentary. These are historic events. And these judgments, as they've already taken place, they've already taken place. Yet we don't have any record of heavens rolling up like a scroll. The one on e the judgment on Edom uh, she says that ver that very thing, or stars falling from the heavens, etc., etc., etc. This is just the way the prophets wrote of the judgment of God, and the day of the Lord was any specific judgment. Is there going to be a, a day of the Lord at the end? Yes, but you can't just pick up that phrase and go, "Oh, that automatically means the day." No. Because 99 times out of 100, or 9 times out of 10, let me go back to 90%, it's speaking of past judgments. Um, it's just the way they wrote uh, about judgments of God when, it, when the, His judgment fell on nations of peoples, and we have the same thing in Matthew 24. Therefore, we can't say these things have to be in the future because we haven't literally seen stars falling and the heavens rolling up like a scroll. Because you need to know that all these verses, every one I've quoted it to you, whether you're talking about Israel or a pagan nation, speak of catastrophic political reversals. A nation is being judged and something is changing. That's what's happening in 70 AD. And you've got the, the phrase, all the tribes of the earth will mourn. That refers to Zechariah chapter 12, verses 10 through 14. And you've got the Son of Man. Coming in the clouds on clouds on the clouds of heaven, there's the cloud language again, with power and great glory. This refers, nobody's in dispute about this, refers to back to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. So let's read that before we think that's the second coming. Because the word is totally different. It's not parousia. Speaking of a different type of coming. And when we read it in Daniel chapter 7, you know what you're going to see? He's going the wrong way. Essentially, look at this, verse 13. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. Direct quote. Same phrase. 
He came to the Ancient of Days, that's the Father, and they brought Him near before Him. Where? He's in heaven, ascending to heaven, going to the throne. And then look what happens. Then to Him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, Gentiles and all, nations and languages should serve Him. His dominion is, present tense, an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and His kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Now, when you go back to this, and you see, oh, it's coming, it's the coming, it's not second coming. Because the coming's actually going. He's coming to the throne. He's not coming to earth. It's a different Greek word. Okay, this is what's known as enthronement or ascension language. In the passage, Jesus, the Son of Man, is coming, erkomai is a Greek word, not parousia, to the throne in heaven in order to be given an everlasting kingship over all peoples. Think about it. What's Jesus been saying is going to happen all through the, since, as soon as he got to, well, sometimes prior, but especially once he got to Jerusalem. He's saying the Old Testament system's going away. I've been preaching about the kingdom for years. It's been inaugurated here on earth, though the consummation is still in the future. So since the old system is going away, it's necessary that the new system has to be put in place. And that's what's happening. That coming of the Son of Man on clouds, He's not coming here. He's going up there and He's getting the throne. And stuck, and we'll, I'll read you some verses here in a second. But it says they're going to see it. Nobody has seen that. Therefore, it must be the future. Well, how will the tribes see it? Or how will we, in the sense of the, the context, how will, that they, how will they know this to be true? Is it because they actually see some celestial phenomenon? Or is it because of what they see happening on earth by the destruction of the temple? Which are the signs he says or how you'll know what's going to happen? Especially if they've been listening, knowing that, the, that it means the reign of the Son of Man in heaven begins to take effect and the gathering of his chosen peoples from all over the nations. Listen to what Jesus said at his trial, speaking to the high priest, Matthew 26, 64. Jesus said to him, it is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Same language. You're going to see me on the throne. How are they going to see that? Old system's going away. He's essentially giving them a generation's worth of grace to know I'm going to give you a sign when, boom, it's officially inaugurated. Look what Jesus says to his disciples later on in Matthew, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. There's a lot more, but I'm, I'm already running out of time. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Here we go, same phrasing. Baptizing them, name the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the... I'll let you go check up the Greek there. Give a little homework. He's, when he see, meets, talks with them, Matthew 28, I've got that authority now. You know when he got it? Well, in the same sense. But what he's talking about is that that coming, he goes to the throne, and then he's kind of being handed over the power. All right? He's got the deal. Everybody goes, well, what's going on? Wait a minute. Let's, if you want to read, I'll give you another reference. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 23 through 28. And it talks about when Jesus is everything, all things are put under him. And then eventually when it's all in fruition, he will hand it back to the Father. This is, the, this is what we're talking about here. So when Jesus meets his disciples in Galilee, he already had all the authority bestowed upon him. Now, when you take all this into effect and all the stuff we've been reading all throughout Matthew about the Gentiles coming together in the kingdom, and you're going to see this, all of these things that are kind of seem to be in isolation come to reach a, a sort of consummation point. And then we go all into verse 31. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now know once again what Jesus said earlier in Matthew. Matthew 8, verses 10 through 12. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, speaking to a Gentile, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from the east and the west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom, look at all the parables, the Jewish nation as a whole, I'm not being anti-Semitic, 
Because I've already told you that Jesus pronounced judgment was on that generation. Not Jews for all time or anything else. That generation, he was there. Those that did not believe, they still had the option to believe. The sons of the kingdom we cast it cast into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Several times I made mention as we've gone through Matthew that Jesus is talking about the acceptance, the inclusion of the Gentiles, and now that's what happens. That's what the disciples are supposed to preach and teach, and that's what they do, and they're martyred for it. As Jesus said, look out, they're going to kill you in the synagogue. But then, and that started at his ascension, all right? But the sign of it being inaugurated and kicked off is what we read in Matthew 24 when the destruction of that temple comes. That is the official end date of the Jewish system. They can't sacrifice. Can't do any of it anymore. There's a new sheriff in town, so to speak. Once again, once the old system is gone and Jesus officially takes the throne, the new system is officially inaugurated, the Great Commission officially kicks off, and anyone who believes Jew and Gentile alike, either one, are brought into the kingdom. No longer just a national designation, but a new nation is being formed. And a spiritual nation composed of all who believe. And you see that at Pentecost. Now, in a, in a sense, at Pentecost. Now, verse 32. Here we go. I'm going to try to get out of some gymnastics that people jump through here. Now, learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, all the things he's been talking about, know that it's near at the doors. But surely I say to you, this generation, which generation? I ain't talking about my generation, not the who's. This generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will by no means pass away. And so now, some people feel like they have to rescue Jesus because he was apparently wrong if we read it that, that that generation couldn't pass away because we've got all these End time references. No, we don't. I hope I've shown that to you. And if you don't believe me, I'll at least say that it's plausible. Because that's context. That's not eisegesis where we've got some sort of system somebody wrote about, now we've got to try to force it in there. And Jesus is jumping all over the page from, from one question to another. No, no, no. We're being consistent here. The fig tree. That's always Israel. No, it's not. I think I've proven that throughout the book of Matthew. All that Jesus interprets it. When a fig tree blooms, you know summer is near. Not Israel. And so when you see this, you know what? Know that it's near. In beginning and end of parables. Sometimes the fig tree is, is, is Israel, as I've given you old, re time, old Testament references for, but not all the time. When you see the things, the blooms, know that the destruction is near. This generation... Which generation? That generation. No, it can't be because we haven't seen the stars fall out of the sky and all this kind of stuff. I've already shown you the Old Testament context. You can't go there. Not to be consistent. I mean, you can choose to do that, but you can't be consistent hermeneutically and do that. So, this generation will by no means pass away all, till all these things take place. Not a generation 2,000 years from that time. Well, the generation, Israel's the fig tree, the generation that sees... Israel will become a nation. Is that what it says? No, it ain't. No, it's not. Excuse me. No, it's not. Well, that's what it means. Well, how do you know? Do you have any Old Testament precedent for that? Is there anything in the context that will lead you to think that? I think not. That's an extrapolation that's been brought in. All right? I'm, I'm as pro-Israel as you can get. I'm just telling you, you can't get there from this fig tree reference. That's all I'm saying. Remember, Jesus is answering the first part of the question which concerns the, the destruction of the temple, not the parousia, as is evidenced by the language, which is what we'll start talking about next week. That generation will not pass away before those things were to take place. Though the heavens and the earth will pass away one day, but my words will not pass away, Jesus says. You can take that to the bank. There's no need to try to rescue Jesus. There's no need to try to sanitize the Bible. He knows what he's talking about. He said that generation. No need to do mental or linguistic gymnastics which sound good at this level but don't cut any cake at the scholarly level when it to the people that, that deal with this all the time. No need to do the gymnastics to try to make it fit. Just see what's happening. He'll talk about the end stuff here in a minute. No need to make him, no need to come to his rescue. So, Jacob, I know I have just really messed up your schedule. 
and I'm sorry. I've really tried not to. But amidst our attempts to grasp Bible prophecy and all that that entails, the ultimate hope we have here is that, that God's Word is never going to pass away. No matter what happens here, no matter, no, bad, no matter how bad things seem to be on the international scene or the national scene or even on our personal scene, His Word will never pass away. And the Bible is full of promises to the children of God, and those won't pass away. And one of those promises is that He's coming back for us in order that we can spend eternity with Him, as well as those believers who have gone on before us. Those things will never pass away. So before we divide up into camps, like between Republicans and Democrats and all the other whatever points in between and want to start throwing rocks and that sort of thing, let's don't do that. Notice something if you study the book of Revelation, that there's a blessing to those who read it and understand not so much reading and understanding a timeline, because that's the way everybody looks at it. It's a blessing to those who obey it. How do you obey a timeline? I think it shows that in some cases we've gotten our perspective a little off of what the book is supposed to be a revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's prophetic. But it doesn't mean that all there is there is a timeline that we're trying to figure out, put a poster up, make charts, and go and put our flag in the ground and say, I've got it all figured out. Because nobody has. Not totally. It's to, to reveal Jesus Christ in order that we can obey Him. And so before we get all weirded out about prophecy, and, and, and I'm not standing in the corner out there today. I'm going to stand by the door. So one or both of us can head out in the parking lot and, and scatter. But the, the point is, before we get so spooled up about all this, let's sit back, take a breath, See what the Word of God says before we start trying to put it into our preconceived notions and systems and just know that whoever is right, and, and I'll be honest with you, in a lot of ways I don't care, but whoever is right, God is still coming back. And he's still coming back for us. And you can argue about when, but we know He's coming back. And that's the important thing. Would you all bow your heads, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you, Lord. And I, I just continue to thank you for this... Uh, for this discourse, the Olivet Discourse, but also prophecy, Lord, even though, um, even though many times when no matter where you are, you teach it, you stir up more devils than you can cast out, and that's unfortunate. But, Father, one thing we can all take away and come, to agree, and come into agreements on is that you're coming back for us, that you love us, you made us a promise, an eternity with you. And a new heaven and a new earth, Lord, that is, that is the end result. So I ask, Lord, that we not quiver and bicker over some of the sideline issues, but we just sit back, take a breath, and know that wherever we settle down, Lord, your promises are not void. Your word will never pass away. And that's what we are endeavoring to understand better. So, Father, I just ask that you bless us in that. Give us humility. Because none of us have it totally figured out. And let us listen and dialogue and see and just with interest explore these things. For there's no reason to draw war lines over it. So I thank you, Lord God. Thank you for that perspective. Lord, and I thank you for the, the, the built in things you have in your word that should humble us. Because some things we simply don't know. We love you, Lord. We thank you because we know that you know. And we put our faith in that. We know that you know the end of all things. And we know that you know us. Those of us who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And we can take that to the bank also. Thank you, Father, for this time together. I ask that you just bless everyone. Keep us safe. Keep us well. Lord, as we talk about these things, we chew on them. And we come back again here next week to worship you. That's what it's all about, worshiping you, Father. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.